Hi everyone, Frankie from Easy Powerwall. Welcome to this week's episode. A few weeks ago, I got a not so nice present. I received my new digital meter. The meter came for free, but it has a serious impact on our family. First of all, we have no longer net metering. Secondly, white collar criminals and the grid company have set up a very dodgy energy scheme where you pay a high fee if you use a lot of energy in a short time frame. This week's project is all about peak shaving. How can we reduce the high peaks in our energy demand and avoid these high fees? I hope I sparked your interest. Let's dive into the video. During my research, I stumbled on an article about my grid company using 50 year old jet engines to cope with peak demand. That article made me think of my own peak demand. Time to start my favorite part of the energy hobby. Thinking, engineering and tinkering. What if I connect two microinverters to the 60 kW battery and activate these microinverters when there is a high demand? I could use an EMS system like Home Assistant to switch these microinverters. Let's start a proof of concept. I will do this step by step, you should be able to replicate this build. First step is making the support for two microinverters. I had some spare wooden boards that are perfect for the job. Distances are not critical, but make sure it's at least 75 cm above the floor. Future episodes will tell why. Here I'm mounting a bottom bracket to support two bus bars to interconnect the microinverters and the battery. To hold the microinverters in place, I mounted a piece of wood. Make sure it's a few centimeter wide, this will help to improve the stability. The weight of the inverters is not that much, but make sure it's connected well. In the clip you will see I drilled one hole to support the M6 threaded rod. Later in the process I added another one because the support wasn't stable enough. Make sure to learn from my mistakes, you will find a few more along the presentation. While I had the tools at hand, I took a moment to install the bus bars too. The microinverter comes in a nice box and is well protected from all sides by the foam. The box contains a color printed manual too, very surprised about that. I chose this model over others because it's one of the more powerful ones and it accepts voltages over or 260 volts. And that's a pretty rare find. Most inverters accept no more than 50 volts. It all looks very professional and well finished. To mount the inverter, slide it into the two threaded rods and fix it with two nuts. Repeat the same procedure for the other side too. You see I have more nuts on the threaded rod. It's just easier for future expansion. Safety is a very important topic. I try to add several layers of protection in each project. Here I'm installing an inline fuse on the positive pole of the microinverter. I installed a 15 amp model but you will see later in the clip that 20 amp was a better choice. To make it easy for myself, I ordered pre-made cable with MC4 connector. One connector is connected to the microinverter and the other side I removed the connector to mount a new ring lug. Remove 8mm of the cable sheet and with the correct tools the job is done in seconds. Offline I did the same for the three other cables. Under the video there's a link to all parts and tools used in this video. Next is preparing the connection between the microinverter and the DIN rail connector. In this part I remove extra cable sheet and mount a ferrule on the thin wires to improve the connection. Of course I have to do this for both microinverters. While I was busy I prepared cables between the same DIN rail connector and the 220 volt breaker box had some spare 2.5 square millimeter cable, of course that's overkill as current per cable will not exceed 4 amps. 
These cables, together with a ground wire, are mounted in a PVC tube on a support beam of the shed. Initial plan was to use these nice colorful din rail blocks, but that wasn't a good idea, so changed my design to a regular din rail connector. Tip: If you prepare the cables, make sure to label them. Here I am sorting out which cable I have to connect to inverter 1 and 2. When that was sorted out, I connected the cables to the din rails. Two cables for both micro inverters. The third cable is a spare one, maybe for future expansion. Just installing it now, adding later is more complex and more time consuming. To finish this part of the project, I have to connect micro inverter 1 and 2 to the DIN rail. The inverters are installed, they need to be switched on when there is a load. And of course I need some logic for that. This will all be driven by home assistant. I need a bigger breaker box. This one has only yeah, one rail and I need yeah, several rails for my setup. For this proof of concept I received some support from my friend Nuno. He had the used breaker box that I could have. That saved a few bucks. The breaker box is installed with 15 screws to make sure it can hold all the future hardware upgrades. I left some space between the cable gutter and breaker box that will allow me to put the cover back on the cable tray once the job is done. Once the breaker box was in place I installed the new earth leakage circuit breaker and the main breaker. This setup is very close to the initial setup and transparent for the family. The green power link towards the house and car charging point is restored. For every micro inverter, I will install a pair of these, a remote control switch. I will use the Zigbee protocol and a breaker just yeah, to protect the circuit. I chose for a 6 amp breaker, they have 3 amp breakers too. If you want to use a smaller micro inverter and use more of them, maybe you can choose the 3 amp model. I already prepared two sets for the breaker box. I did the programming offline in my COSI room and I labeled them B1, B2, booster 1, booster 2. It's a good idea to label these uh, switches. It's much easier to integrate them in the system. This will go to line in and this connection goes to the micro inverter. I have to connect a lot of breakers to line in, so I'll provide a special tool or item to connect all the line ins to one distributor. I have two Zigbee switches installed. Let me unbox one and show you how easy it is to integrate it into the Zigbee network. These Zigbee switches come in a nice retail package. The brand Tangu might not sound familiar to you, it's a very well established brand in China and it has been around for 30 years. The box contains a nice operating manual in 10 languages. First step is to connect the Zigbee switch to mains. Once done you can already perform a manual check and verify if the relay inside the Zigbee controller works. When switched on, the LED behind the switch will be on. A nice to have is that you can set and change the behavior of the LED in Home Assistant. To pair the Zigbee controller with Zigbee network, you have to press 5 seconds on the button. The blue LED above the button will start blinking. Now before we enter the Home Assistant world, I will show you what your options are to run Home Assistant. It's not the scope of this movie to start from scratch on how to install and how to configure the system. But if I can do it, chances are pretty high you can do it too. I chose to work with the 10 client, a small PC only running Home Assistant software. Other popular options are Windows or Linux PC, Raspberry Pi and Home Assistant's own product line with the Home Assistant green or yellow. Check the website and choose what works best for you. I chose the tin client 
for the price and it came pre-installed with Home Assistant. Check eBay or local second-hand websites for offers. Next to the Home Assistant server, you need a Zigbee controller. I work with this sort of controller. It's just plug and play. Use an USB extension cable. I read about some interference issues when connected directly into the USB port of the Home Assistant server. A link to the hardware I used in this video is available under the video. Now let's go back to the blinking blue Zigbee LED. Connect to the Home Assistant server by typing the IP address and port number. In the overview page you find an overview of all the devices. At the right you see both booster 1 and 2. To add the new Zigbee device go to settings device and services and finally select Zigbee Home Automation. Click on add device, the system will start looking for new hardware. It finds it right away and adds it to the system. To finish the integration, give the device a unique name and the location where it will be installed. Check a video on YouTube on naming convention. This will help you in the future if you want to create automation and scenes. Click back and you will find the integration in the Zigbee hardware list. I noticed I made a mistake with the naming of the device. No big deal. Just click on the edit pencil and change the name. All underlying entities will change automatically. I will use this piece of hardware as the line-in distributor. So line-in will come from the breaker box. It will be connected to one of the copper bus bars. One will be for line-in. The deepest one will be used as neutral. And then I will make a connection from here to the breaker. I made some progress. Next step is connecting the load Both breakers are connected. The black cable is the cable to the inverter. The gray cable here is the cable to the AC in distributor. And we have to connect the DC from the battery. I will use uh, the same cable that I used to connect the battery with the bus bars and an ANL fuse that will act as a, yeah, if I have a dead short, then this fuse will melt. I'm not gonna show the process of building all cables, it's pretty straightforward. Prepare heat shrink tube for both sides of the cable and put the connector on the cable core. When I started with the power wall, I invested in a hydraulic crimp tool and I use it quite often. If you plan to use a serious power wall, it's a very good investment. For occasional work, a manual crimper works too. Put the cable lug on the cable and start the crimping workout. I did this for the positive and negative cable. The shrinking tube makes it look nicer and more professional. Do you remember the DIY bus bars? I don't know if I was smart, but when I created these bus bars, I already foresaw an extra M10 thread to connect an, an extra cable. And now, luckily, I can connect this cable, I already foresaw one, for the positive. And I will add one for the negative too. No rocket science in the next steps. First, I'm connecting the DC ground via the ANL fuse to the negative DC bus bar. The other side of the ANL fuse goes to the negative bus bar of the battery. Once done, the positive cable is next in line. Offline, I mounted the DC breaker that acts as a switch on a DIN rail. As a final step, I tighten all nuts and perform a final check on all connections. Now I'm ready to flip the switch. Well, ready to flip the breaker in this case. Always exciting. No pops, no bangs, no magic smoke. But hey, what's that? Inverter number two is a no-show. A DOA or dead on arrival? Let's check. Hmm, strange. No voltage on the input. 
Next step, check the inline fuse. Continuity test failed. Was this fuse a DOA? Didn't pre-charge the microinverter. Was the inrush current too high? Don't know. Luckily, I had a spare at hand. Replace the inline fuse and we're up and running with two inverters. Later, another 15 amp fuse blew. Just make sure to get your hands on the 20 amp model. Both micro inverters are working. Just switched on breaker of AC in. So I have to be careful here. Let me switch on this breaker. For a test, I made a little automation. Go to settings and then automations and scenes. Add a new automation or edit an existing one. When power requested from the grid is more than 1000 Watt, activate booster. When power is below 1000 Watt, deactivate booster one. This sounds logic, but it isn't correct. We'll explain this in the next movie when I go more into detail in these kinds of settings. But if you know the answer, feel free to share it in the comments. Activate heater. And the switch is on. Switch it off right now. Let me show you one more time. Lights here. Off and immediately off. I love it when a plan comes together. Let's see how the quick and dirty energy dashboard looks like. Booster is delivering 774 watts, over delivering. Not sure if I should try to limit the current. If you click on the booster window, a pop-up appears with energy generated over the past 24 hours. The booster is mainly active when we prepared lunch and dinner. Let's end the video here. I think we can come to the conclusion that this proof of concept has been a huge success. At least I'm very pleased with the performance and I'm sure it will slash my energy bills. But this is not the end. I will make a follow-up video in a few weeks or months and see how the system performs over time. In the meantime, if you have questions or remarks, please use the comments. I'll be happy to help you out and add these answers in the next video. I will also compare this setup with today's popular option like plug-in battery. See how it compares price-wise and performance-wise. I also have a question for you. Today I'm using this microinverter full throttle. Is this a good idea? Or should I try to limit the current and throttle down the performance? I'm really looking forward for your answers. For now, I would like to say thank you very much. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up and I'm sure we'll meet again soon for another video. This was Frankie for Easy Powerwall.